Okay. Welcome to today's stream. Thanks for being here. Give me just a moment. I'll get the chat up on the screen just in case we feel like chatting. And there it is. Okay. So we'll put this right over here. When I uh, started this up earlier, because I, you know, announced the stream earlier today, or, or posted it, whatever. One of the first things it showed me when it, it, after you set up the stream, it immediately takes you to the stream, like, dashboard, even though you're not going to start yet. It's just like, here's all your stuff. Uh, and in the chat window section, sorry, in the chat window section, it had a big pop-up that says, hey, you can now put people in timeouts. <laughs> I found very funny. I mean, I, I obviously it has a very practical purpose. Like it makes sense for others uh, who stream on YouTube, and it matters not at all for us, which is a good thing. But but at the same time, it, it's funny to me then that they seem like the way it was presented. They were like very proud. They really wanted you to notice it. So I I yeah. I was laughing about that. Um, I don't remember if it told me how to do that. Oh, look, there's a plus button that says engage with your audience. What is this? Start a Q&A. <laughs> and a poll. I might actually use the poll for something. Uh, this is money. I don't think we need that. <laughs> I don't think anyone needs to send money. Uh, cool. All right. Well, here we are. We are set up and ready to go with today's stream. And, uh, yep, as the title implies, we'll be talking about, in a, in a very general, loosey-goosey kind of way, we will be talking about the, the, the current state of, of animation, the relative health of animation. Do we think that animation is, is doing well right now? Do we think that it's and not just doing well, because that could kind of boil down to, like, financial results. Um, and I don't want to limit it that much. We can talk about that, too. But but uh, a broader sense of, like, is it is it is it giving a decent amount of variety in terms of what is being produced? Are we, uh, are the, is the work successful? All kinds of things we can talk about for the relative health of the animation industry. So we'll be doing that a little bit later, but before that we have quite a few juicy little stories here on Cartoon Brew. Um, and some sp very prominent sponsored content, by the way. You kind of have to scroll down, but this is this is indeed... Um, oh, is it gone? I promise this is a sponsored thing about Nimona. And earlier there was a thing I was like, by the way, this is... Um, Quite the headline here. How Netflix and Annapurna resurrected one of the most courageous animated films of all time. My goodness. Now, the safe thing about saying one of the most, and then following that with anything at all, is very safe. <laughs> There's no, no one's uh, going to be able to fact check that. Right. If you say the most, then there's some controversy. But saying one of the most courageous, much safer. Um, and I maybe disagree. Uh, not because of, you know, the content, but rather the execution. I don't think... I don't know if just, like, flat-out inclusion of gay characters if that's exclude i don't maybe they're referring to more than that but i don't know if that alone qualifies as being one of the most courageous animated movies of all time i i i would hope that we're past that but maybe we're not i don't know or maybe there's i don't know something about the character of nimona uh, herself i don't know Maybe I should look into that sponsor content uh, some more, but that is not what caught my eye. There's there's plenty of other stuff to talk about here as we we sort of head face first into award season here. Uh, so yeah, Toots is here. Welcome back, Toots. It's good to see you. Toots says, I am engaging. This is engagement. Everything is. That's the nice thing, right? Any activity is engagement. I think, well, 
I was about to say, I, I bet even lurking is considered some form of engagement, but like probably not <laughs> in terms of website analytics and stuff that probably doesn't count as engagement. Just a hunch. Um, and then I swear to goodness, half an hour before I got the iPad capture set up and it was working flawlessly up until I started the stream. I, I walked over there to get water and I came back and the iPad capture was like, we, we don't want to work anymore. <laughs> we, uh, would prefer not to. Um, so we'll see about that, but I wanted to use that for some of, uh, some of the stuff we'll be talking about later in the stream. Uh, anyway, how are you dudes? Um, should we chat at all about the like game awards stuff slash mild controversy of game awards? Uh, I don't know if it's worth it. That was the topic of the stream last week. If if you weren't here, um, day before the game awards, and now it has happened, and I feel like already the um, you know any controversies and backlash are sort of dying out at this point. They they don't tend to last for very long, and to be fair, they're not like. They are not the world's most serious controversies. Even in the world of video gaming, they're they're not the most serious thing. So, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, there was some nonsense with that. Um, I didn't really get a lot of the uh, stories. I didn't get like a lot of the gossip or anything from my, my friend who went to the show live. I, I guess I could ask um, what the vibe was like there, but I, we, we have heard quite a bit at this point of like uh, the realities of the show itself um, and some of the the less admirable choices that were made in producing that show and specifically their their way of uh, pushing the award stuff very much off to the side. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I don't know any any expectation that this is like legitimately supposed to be a show that's all about celebrating video games and you know acknowledging it as as a serious art form. Um, I don't. It never has been. I don't. I don't understand why it it, it is a vehicle for for advertising. Um, it's an entrepreneurial endeavor. Uh, so I don't know. I, I'm not terribly surprised by some of the choices. Also, apparently, they've decided to continue some of the contract work upstairs at 6 p.m., which is, um, I don't quite understand. <laughs> Dude says, if you want to talk about the game words, I'll listen. I don't really have an opinion, except people make game, people make games should have won. Oh, you mean you didn't want the VTuber to win? <laughs> you didn't think that... A VTuber winning best content creator or whatever it was was like significant. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I also don't want to. Uh, I don't want to, you know, talk trash on just some someone who's just they are a professional content creator. I don't know if Iron Mouse has like professional media company backing or anything like that. Um, that's when I start to get less sympathetic. But if it's just a person making stuff and they happen to be popular, like, cool, all right. You know, and, and that's the thing, too, is I'm just going to assume that there were fans of that person among the, the voting audience or the, the, the media outlets who, who vote on those awards and stuff. So I, I don't know. Um, it's a whole thing. But yeah, no, honestly, at this point, like, it's, yeah, it has been just a week, but it already feels like those uh, conversations are old hat so yeah we don't we don't have to get any uh, any of that stuff um unplugging and plugging back in at this point to try to get this working it's just not having it i don't i just don't get why it would work at one point <laughs> and then it just stops <laughs> um okay the only other thing that was kind of frustrating i guess is the um cocoon won best debut 
indie game or best indie game from a debut studio, whatever. It's an indie game from a brand new studio. And of course, what, what I was talking about last time around was just how goofy it was that while uh, that was technically a new studio, it was, a, it's, as far as I know, a bunch of industry vets. Um, so it, it fe seemed like it defeated the purpose. But again, with, with that in mind, <laughs> with the idea that it's not actually an award show about the awards, what did, what did we expect? You know? What did we expect? What, what were we thinking about that? It's fine. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. We're all moving on with our lives. A okay, right? Um, cool. All right. So that's that. Um, I really wish I could do some more troubleshooting of this thing. I don't understand why it would be so difficult, but that tends to just be the case um, with this stuff. Where, where, where is it? Yeah, this. Yeah. Look at that. Okay. Okay, well. <laughs> whatever. I'll leave this up. Um, I just need this off to the side. I need this to stay awake until I'm ready to use the iPad for stuff. Just, uh, you just stay over here, iPad, and remain calm. I'm just going to put you right there. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, like I said, there is some new stuff here that's kind of interesting. So let's let's have a chat about it. Um, okay. Uh, just nominations for Critics Choice Awards. Let's just look at the list. Let's let's see what we got. Um, we don't. I mean, we don't really care about much of the stuff besides the animated category, at least for the moment. So let's look at those. Critics Choice certainly not the most prestigious, but it is one of those. Uh, okay more significant middling award shows that people tend to pay attention to as like indicators of what will end up getting oscars stuff like that um boy in the hair and studio Ghibli, yes gotcha elemental yes nimona sure uh, across the spider verse obviously tmnt all right and then wish <laughs> wish is certainly the oddball here in a sense um it is not unexpected from the perspective of it's Disney. It is basically the Disney animated feature film that came out this year, unless there was... I, I certainly don't remember any other big uh, big instances. Obviously, we have the Pixar movie here as well. Um, okay. And yeah, I mean, do we even... Kind of fun that uh, Across the Spider-Verse gets over here for, for visual effects. I, that, that's, that's notable. It's the only animated movie in this category. Um, and yeah, don't care about these other things. So yeah, Wish Wish is an oddball, uh, just in terms of quality and critical reception. And that's, yeah, especially funny because it is critics. <laughs> these are, uh, supposedly professional critics. So, odd. Um, yeah. An odd choice, but at the same time, it's Disney. I just, they, they, they get a seat. You know, it's like Paul McCartney always has an invite to the Grammys. Is that the music one? Yeah. Uh, regardless of what he's done <laughs> in any given year or any given decade, like, you invite Paul McCartney, you nominate the Disney movie, and that's that's that. Uh, Toot says, I'm sad about the passing of E3. None of the live streams or events that replace it are, are worthy in my eyes. E3 allowed people to, to fail catastrophically in front of an audience, and that made it special. Well, yeah, I well, I I basically agree. The only thing I really want to point out as a special point of uh, agreement is that there was a feeling of specialness, right? Uh, as you're mentioning here, there's the cringe comedy, you know, aspect of just like, yeah, there were some spectacularly terrible demonstrations, and they've gone down in history, and people continue to enjoy <laughs> observing and consuming that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, I just, it, they also had a very different pacing, um, even up until the more recent years, just because it was a particular publisher or platform giving their own presentation. You didn't always feel that there was heavily, uh, the pacing wasn't always very quick at all. And especially when you look back to some of the E3s from the, the early 2000s, uh, or early 2010s that we still have footage of, um, very slow pacing most of the time 
And that also reflects in part the fact that it was very much an industry conference thing. It was for other businesses. It was for journalists, sort of. Uh, it morphed into that public event and became something very different. And that is what we now have in, in the form of the Summer Game Fest stuff and the other, other more bespoke private stuff. It's just, it's only directed at consumers, basically. And so they treat it like a giant string of ads, which is what it is, of course. But there's very little flavor in that to me, and it absolutely does not feel special. Watching Summer Game Fest does not feel special by any stretch of the imagination. It feels incredibly bland and in incredibly rushed. I, I, I can't even really watch that. Even the, I tried to watch the Game Awards while I was working last week. I couldn't do it after a certain point. Just too much. Too much information and such an insane variety. <laughs> In a way, the variety is good, but also just the tonal shifts are all over the place. And within such a short span of time, it's uncomfortable, I think. It's just uncomfortable to watch. Sorry, rambling. Whatness, welcome back. How's it going? Uh, what have you been up to? Whatness says, I saw on Reddit that Velma, uh, Velma Velma, or is it just called Velma, was nominated for Best Adult Animation of the Year. How? Where? What, um, for this, for, for critics' choice, do they do, uh, shows? Yeah, I'd, I'd like some more info on that. I, honestly, I forgot about Velma. Of course, I remember the dog pile around Velma, but. Witness also says, Wikipedia mods work fast. Lol, E3 already saw, already says E3 was instead of is. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's kind of a running joke with, uh, like, celebrity deaths as well, right? Like, immediately it seems like somebody has gone on there. And like, oh, this person was an American actor, comedian, politician, business tycoon. Those are pretty common labels, I think. Um, yeah, anyway, but yeah, I, where did Velma... For what, like, Emmys? I feel like Emmys are later, but I don't actually remember. Maybe Golden Globes? Well, isn't there? Yeah, here's another awards thing we can talk about while we're still in the same the same vein here. Uh, they also released their nominations. Um, Jamie at Cartoon Bruce says that these, some of these were surprising nominations. <laughs> um, yeah, so what do we got here? Boy and the Heron, gotcha. Elemental, yeah, same as before. Across the Spider-Verse. Yes, Super Mario Brothers movie, hilarious. <laughs> Suzume, which we talked about, what was that, a couple weeks ago? And I still haven't watched it, by the way. <laughs> of course not. Uh, and Wish. Now give me some more um, information. Perhaps this year's most surprising nominee is Disney's Wish which was panned by critics and is being ignored by audiences. I thought it was doing okay at the box office. I guess not. It's one of Disney's most poorly reviewed theatrical animated films ever and will surely be one of the studio's biggest box office bombs. It is hard to see what Golden Globes voters saw in Wish that audiences have not... And, and critics. <laughs> um, why are they working... Why are they, what are they doing to the floor above my head right now? What, what could it be? I really hope it's not picking up on the mic. I apologize if it is. <sighs> okay. Um, anyway, uh, yes, we, we generally agree. Uh, but yeah, isn't this the Hollywood, wait, what is it? Hollywood foreign... Press Association? Is that who runs the Golden Globes? I, it's such a weird name. And they're not exactly prominent in an in a, in a audience-facing capacity in other ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's also a very privately owned thing, you know. Uh, it's not exclusively critics, we know that. It's press. Um, and I don't know, it's at least, there at least have been jokes made in the past about, like, the the people running that award show they just want to hobnob you know they they want to they want to rub shoulders is that the is that the expression rub elbows 
whatever. You know, they want to mingle, they want to network with really prominent people in Hollywood, and a way to do that is to invent an award show and then just nominate the people associated, you know, with a particular movie who you, who you want to meet up with, and there you go. Um, so, again, like, it, it's Disney. Just because it's Disney, that is more than enough to get them a, a, an invite, you know? And probably to save the date. Probably before Wish even released. The Golden Globes were like, hey, <laughs> come on in. You're ready to go. Uh, yeah, so anyway, there we have it. Uh, anything else uh, for award stuff? Oh, yeah. Here we go. A record 33 animated features are in this year's Oscars race. So these are just the films that are eligible to become nominations. Uh, a little bit further down the road. Uh, let's see what we got here. Well, I'm not going to read them all off. That's way too much. Uh, Chicken Runs here hasn't released yet, as far as I know, right? Does that release this week? Elemental, the Ernest and Celestine uh, sequel. Still haven't watched. Don't know what the first slam dunk is. Leo is here. <laughs> I'm going to guess Leo is not going to make it. Does anyone have any read on that? Like, obviously, Leo has been very popular. Do we think Adam Sandler's wonderful movie is going to get a nod? Uh, I just, I, I'm very tempted to just flat out say no. Uh, there we have it. Monkey King, Nimona, Paw Patrol, eligible. Remember, we said eligible. Uh, yeah, plenty of foreign stuff. I'm not very familiar with, at least not yet. Um, Ruby Gilman, eligible. <laughs> uh, across the Spider-Verse, yes. Okay, I mean, should we just... How how many get nominated? Uh, what is it? Five, six, seven? That four years ago. Da, 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 da. Okay. Okay, so let's just go. I, I, you know what? I'm gonna go crazy. I'm gonna say Wish will not get a nomination. I think this is an opportunity for the Academy to 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 show up the other award shows and be like, you know what? Just because they're Disney doesn't mean they can come into our playground. Um, Unicorn Wars. You know what? I don't know. It's funny. Obviously, with other categories, they have weird limits about when. Foreign film, meaning films produced outside of the U.S., are allowed to be nominated for various categories. They tend to get pigeonholed and into their own little spots. I don't know if there is a similar restriction with the animated feature films. I don't think so, right? So if that is the case, this immediately becomes a much more interesting category, assuming they don't exclusively pay attention to the big studio releases. Um, so, like, I would like to see Unicorn Wars show up in the nominees i i can't say that it's likely but it would be it would it would shake things up a little bit you know and it would revive just a little bit of the conversation around that movie and it would certainly attract more attention to the movie which again i i don't think it's the best thing ever but it's still neat and very well done for for what it is um yeah what it says as a mythology nerd i have i have a bias uh to the monkey king to win, but it probably won't win. Um, I mean, well, talking about winning, that's, that's you know, that's harder and obviously much more, even more competitive. Um, but I don't, I, I could see it getting nominated. I, I, at the very least, I know it was very popular and I think it reviewed relatively well. It's yet another one I still haven't seen. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, but no, I could I could see it getting a nomination again. Like, and that was a Netflix movie, right? At least here in the U.S., it was released through Netflix. Um, so yeah, if if there's enough room, you know, if they don't have weird rules about like, oh, you can only have two animated feature nominees that weren't made in the U.S., this could be very interesting, especially because The Boy and the Heron is an absolute shoe in as a nominee, not necessarily as a winner. Uh, Toot says, wow, the YouTube bot is really sensitive today. Oh, no. What were you, what kind of slanderous nonsense were you trying to uh, put in the chat, Toots?
What kind of crazy stuff were you, were you trying to say there? Sorry, I will be using this thing later on. I thought I would be able to doodle and, and talk about the new stuff at the same time, but I don't I don't think it's gonna happen. I'll just leave this here for now. I just didn't want it sitting on like a stark white background here. Oh, that's something. Ew. Okay. Ernest and Celestine doesn't have a chance. Doesn't have a chance. There is no no buzz. <laughs> you need the buzz. It's Hollywood. You gotta have some kind of buzz going on. I kind of feel the same way about the uh, Ladybug movie. Um, and of course, there always has to be an awkward mix of like stuff very much animated features, very much meant for an adult audience, and then just like the very standard studio fare for children. Um, yeah, and Super Mario Brothers movie. I mean, I guess we, you know, we can argue about it if we want. I don't think it's getting nominated. <laughs> I, I just, I don't know if they feel the need to fill out the category. I, I maybe, just based on the uh, talk about buzz. I mean, it was there. It did do well financially. I don't know. Toot says I tried to make a, a, a joke. It's entirely G-rated, but it vaguely referenced a narrative that certain bad actors use. Oh no! Wow. So the so the sensor bot is like picking up on like, uh, what like weird uh, argumentative techniques, <laughs> like like concepts that have been warped through internet discourse. That's pretty. <laughs> that's pretty sophisticated. <laughs> Um, unless the name itself is something like, you know, alarming or, or something like that. Whatna says, so update on my One Piece viewing. Um, on the war right after the crew got separated. Oh. Hmm. Don't know if I know. <laughs> well, cause, also because I've only seen or read, you know, maybe half total you know, of, of all One Piece, probably less than half. So it, there's a good chance that you're referring to something I just haven't gotten to yet. Um, but I don't know. I think it was the word su suppress. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I mourn the loss of the joke, but yeah, I guess, uh, I guess they've been tight. And again, timeouts, you know, they're like, hey, you could more features for making chat incredibly strict why not put people in timeouts okay i don't know i also think the idea of a like a, a timeout as being so temporary that's kind of funny whereas you know if someone was doing something incredibly crazy you would rather just ban them right like <laughs> what are the odds that someone is going to uh become I was going to say a good person, but that's not what I mean. Uh, <laughs> that they will be able to restrain themselves well enough after like 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> it's just... Or is it supposed to be like a joke? I don't know. That that would have to be a very particular kind of um, viewing community where you could put people in timeouts for fun. You know? I don't, I don't think that's what we're uh, going for here. Yeah. In the context of the algorithm, mm. Mm -mm -mm. Um, but yeah, what? In this, see if you if if you can give me more details on the One Piece stuff without, unless it's like super spoilery, go, uh, go for it. Um, and you and and regardless of like story detail stuff, I would love to hear just your like uh, just impressions, you know, just thoughts on on where the uh, the series is at that point. Um, I'm down for that. I really do need to. I don't know. I, I really do need to get back t to One Piece. I had switched to reading it after watching the anime for a long time. Um, but even that, I just left behind. Not for lack of interest, just lack of time more than anything else. 
Um, but yeah, okay, it's six thirty. I fit I let me rush through a couple other news things and then we'll we'll talk about our sort of main topic. Uh real quick, a couple of headlines here about the boy and the heron. The boy and the heron is sweeping the p- competition at the box office. Also, this was written on the eighth. So, you know. Uh <laughs> Miyazaki headed for first ever number one U.S. opening, so I don't know whether or not that actually came to pass. Um, mm, okay. So, yeah, very hard to tell. And it seems like an odd article to write, like, mid-weekend, right? No, 8 was Friday. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then this, very funny. The first, it becomes the first original 2D animated film to top the U.S. box office since 2009's *The Princess and the Frog*. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I understand that. <laughs> Off the top of your head, you know whether you're into animation or not. Name five major uh, wide release theatrical animated movies into 2d animated movies in the last 10 years not short films not art house stuff that was you know limited release you can't use unicorn wars here um i don't know it's so specific it's kind of useless uh but it does sound like it ended up making about about 13 million dollars over the whole opening weekend which is not in incredible in a, in a broader scope um but yeah. And then, wow, domestic total. Fish so far is about 50. That's pretty wild, too. Um, okay, well, I'll briefly say, uh, it's it's funny, I was about to say, oh, I've already talked about this movie so much. No, uh, I watched it on Saturday. I watched it on Saturday. I went to the theater. I saw it in IMAX, which was the only way to see it, by the way. They were only doing IMAX screenings of this movie. Um, nice in the obvious ways you know there there are clear benefits to the imax viewing experience but much more expensive um and yeah so i i recorded kind of a lot of of uh footage at least of me talking about the movie over a couple different sittings um and because i've talked about it so much already i feel like i've talked about it openly but i haven't yet because that video hasn't been finished so uh so i guess i will restrain myself more or less but i can say yes i i did see the movie saw it in the theater just went by myself um and pretty long i think it's just over two hour two hours total for the runtime definitely on the long side for uh animated features um yes and what else will i say that doesn't like give away the game um i will say it was the dub, of course. It was the English dub. That's you know because it's G Kids distributing. I don't even know. You would have to look pretty hard to find a screening with the original Japanese audio and then English subtitles. I think. Um, and I will say, without going into details, this is the only performance I hated for the English voice cast. This this character's performance, and I know who it was, but I won't say. The only bad performance, in my opinion. Like, noticeably bad and noticeably annoying, and not in a fun way. Not in an in- endearing way. Um, yeah. So, yeah. There you go. I-, I-, I did watch it, and it sounds like it's doing okay financially, but we all know that the, the critical reception and the, um, uh, you know, well, further critical reception in, in the form of the award season stuff will be probably have a bigger mark <laughs> those those will be a bigger deal for this movie in particular um and you know it, it'll also have a bigger impact for dedicated animation fans dedicated anime fans uh etc who are already very well aware of of miyazaki and studio ghibli but yeah in terms of immediate impact not not yeah not incredible but also not too surprising so there you go. Uh, cool. All right. So then... We will transition slightly. I mean, we're still talking about a lot of the same stuff. 
we will transition slightly to our health checkup for the animation industry in 2023 based on all kinds of things Let's see what we got uh what it says so it's like two years from now because emmys are from june 22 to may and one piece of live action came out in august so in 25 in 25 what awards do you think it will get for uh, for the for the one piece live action you mean yeah i need more details i got hung up on the calendar stuff and i i need more details but if you're asking about awards for for the one piece live action uh and i guess that would be emmys right yeah i mean it would have to be right um no, I well, if they, I, I'm not incredibly familiar with the um, categories for the Emmys, and you know, I don't, I don't pay as much attention, I guess, to to that particular show, or a lot of these shows, to be honest. Um, but I would guess if there is any kind of, uh, if there's any kind of category around adaptation, you know, uh, any category that includes just like. Yeah, uh, either book to screen <laughs> or uh, adaptation of existing property, things like that. If there, wow, it would be so funny if there was a reboot category for some of these award shows. That would make so much sense, and it would be hotly contested. That would easily be one of the most hard won marketing battles. <laughs> in big budget entertainment if there was a reboot awards category or multiple you know you could have one for animated stuff you could have one for live action stuff um that would be a thing that's actually a pretty good idea anyway but yeah just just to say uh if there is some kind of animation category it would hit that i think uh it it did a good enough job and 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 more importantly than that it um the positive reception to the to the live action was was broad enough, was loud enough that I think you know whoever's voting for that particular award show would would agree and would just oh yeah sure that's a shoe in. But when it says I think it gets best lead drama actor, best supporting actor and actress drama. Uh, actress drama is that is that like lead actress in a drama and best drama. And yes, for the Emmys we're talking about. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I guess I could see, I could certainly see nominations for some of the, you know, for for performances. Um, but I, I, I do feel overall that the, it's the the, it's the whole thing. <laughs> it's the overarching adaptation. Uh, it, it's you know, it's not so much the individual components that that stand out as much, at least at least to me and in, in my perspective. Um, but the end product being so successful in in the minds of so many uh existing fans as well as the newcomers and you know that was a huge part of the point of that show was to attract the newcomers you know um it just makes sense uh that that voters would lean that way but yeah totally fair uh yeah i, I appreciate your your thoughts on those as well um cool all right uh, so let's see how how should we do this? I would love. Oh yeah, sorry. One last thing. Apparently, Netflix released a giant report of viewing data, which I really would like to look at in more detail. Uh, the ten most viewed animated series are Paw Patrol, Poco Milan, Little Angel, Paw Patrol, Poco Milan. You would think <laughs> they wouldn't group it. By individual seasons, whatever. Demon Slayer, Poco Milan. Little Angel, Poco Milan. Sonic Prime. So, uh, I'll keep this very brief. Not surprising. I, 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 I feel like, yeah, a big surprise. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm sorry, Jamie. No, no, not a surprise. Um, if, if, if you are familiar with just the streaming landscape and specifically, um, between YouTube and the, and the sort of official streaming services, 
the kids content realm is absolutely massive and has been for many years now which is part of why the whole kappa uh you know kids ads ad tracking data from youtube why that whole scandal was was such a big thing um there is a huge amount of money or was previously uh in this kind of children's entertainment and yeah it's basically a captive audience uh who have an incredible amount of free time many of them are not having their screen time restricted very effectively let's say especially for certain age groups and their viewing choices don't tend to be um quite as selective uh i shouldn't even say that i just like you know like a lot of adults plenty of kids want to watch basically the same thing over and over again i i did the same thing back in my day with with lion king and aladdin mostly um and the wallace and gromit vhs tape of course uh not surprising <laughs> not surprising is the easiest way you know for parents to keep kids entertained and because if it even sort of looks like kids content they'll just say oh that's okay that's safe you know just show them that little do they know the incredibly low quality i mean specifically coco milan is just junk i i will stand by that forever paw patrol mediocre at best i'll say <laughs> um but yeah like and mosh and the bear of course is famous i did i did a whole video about uh the, the youtube children's animation junk years ago i'm i'm not surprised by it and i'm also not surprised to see some of this anime popping up here it's not it's not <laughs> unexpected at all um yeah okay but yeah this would be very interesting to see the full like uh yeah, this it's an Excel doc. Okay, all right. When it says in the in the Emmy, they have multiple best actors for each genre, and, and no, there's no adaptation award yet. But they added best limited series a few years ago. Since that's new, um, yeah, it seems strange. I mean, at the very least, the Oscars has the Oscars in comparison has uh, best adapted screenplay, right? There's original screenplay and adapted screenplay. So while there isn't a best adaptation category for the film as a whole. They're at least acknowledging that portion of it. Um, and I can guarantee that some of the award shows do have a category like that. Uh, oh, yeah, the Game Awards has that. <laughs> we were just talking about it last week. This what best adaptation, you know, movies based on video games. Um, so I, I would assume. I would assume they, they, they would maybe pick up on that at some point. And I think they should. I, I think that's just a fun category. And again, I'm sticking by uh, best reboot. I want best reboot. Uh, reboot or remake category. You know, we'll drop our cynicism for a little bit and just enjoy the the marketing war over <laughs> over major studios trying to win best reboot award. Don't worry, I'm still here. Beautiful. <laughs> this will be interesting. Uh, so they added some, they added some anime and Family Guy to Disney Plus. Does that mean the the Hulu merger is complete now? I mean, I guess it's not a merger. They already owned Hulu, as far as I know, but there's some additional deal there. Sorry. They added some anime and Family Guy to Disney Plus in the U.S., including Kill a Kill? No. No, no, no. Really? They put Kill a Kill on Disney Plus? No. No, no, no. Uh... <laughs> uh... <laughs> There's a game, there has some been some coverage on this. There's a Game Facts <laughs> article, or maybe forum post. Kill the Kill is on Disney Plus. Yeah, this is forum stuff. Due, due to the Hulu merger for Disney Plus America, Kill a Kill is on Disney Plus now. Ryuko is now a Disney princess. 
Sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to linger on this for too long, but um, you know, obviously there is stuff on Disney Plus already that's more. It could be considered more adult, and in fact, you know, a lot of the Marvel stuff, especially the the latter latter day Marvel stuff, can be very serious. And some of the Marvel shows are very serious. Some of the the, the Star Wars spinoffs are are relatively serious, relatively adult, right? But. Yeah, um, Kill la Kill is specifically for American sensibilities around, like, sexualization and, um, just sexual content in general, things like that. Uh, my god, like, I, I would say that they're gonna get a bunch of letters, but nobody, nobody sends letters, so what's, I don't know, social media? No, this, but it already happened. It's just people on forums being like, this is crazy. Oh my gosh. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Toots. Those of us who don't know anything about Kill a Kill, what is it? Uh, yeah, so Kill a Kill is, I, I guess it was the first anime from a, an anime studio called Trigger. Trigger was made up of guys who previously worked at Gynax. Gynax did some very firm, uh, very firm, <laughs> very famous anime. Uh, Gurren Lagann, for one, and I think they worked on Neon Genesis Evangelion as well. But either way, very big. Sorry, let me let me move our iPad stuff here for a little bit. Kill the Kill. Um, the plot uh, of Kill the Kill is that there's a, a fascist ruler of the local school, and the school. Like, the child's rank in the school determines their family's life. So the higher you are up in the social ranking of the school, the better life you have. You live in a better place, you get better stuff, um, things like that. But most people live in a, in a miserable state. Ryuko shows up with half of a set of a giant pair of scissors and says, somebody killed my dad, I want to find out who it was, very anime. But... The sort of visual hook is that um, <laughs> Ryuko uh, and her, her, well, I'll just say for now, nemesis, um, Satsuki Kiryuin, <laughs> have special outfits that are kind of alive and made of magic alien fibers. And they uh, transform into outfits that look like this. So you can imagine the kinds of scenes that we get during, you know, various fights and, and confrontations and that kind of thing. Uh, the the resistance group in the show is called Nudist Beach, and their whole thing is that they don't wear clothing because they see clothing as, like, uh, repressive. You know, it's a, it's a sign of fascism in, in their eyes in the context of this world. Um, and, yeah, just in terms of fan service overall, the show goes very hard in terms of... Uh, uh just putting its characters on display um so i'll leave it there for now but that's a little bit of yeah reminds me of bayonetta i mean yeah like sh like you know we know this is not uh out of the ordinary especially in anime and that's not saying that it's right or wrong whatever but like kill the kill has a very special flair and reputation for this kind of fan service so that in particular is what's making it very funny. Um, I don't know. I almost, I, I, it's impossible, but I almost feel like somebody just didn't tell, like, <laughs> like Disney wasn't paying attention. There's got to be some kind of warning, right? I'll check. I'll check. I think I have someone else's Disney Plus login, so I, I will take a look. Um, two to the exit transition. All right. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Flip notes. How's it going? What's up? What about the reboot of the TV show Reboot? That would be fun, huh? Would that be an automatic winner for the Reboot Awards category? I could see that. They're just like, well, it's in the name. This is very obscure. 
uh, and I'm really reaching back, but th- this is a long time ago. I saw a um, there's some kind of weird survey thing from the early twenty, early to mid twentieth twentieth century, where they interviewed a bunch of like writers and poets and artists and stuff, and they were like, "What is the saddest word in the English language?" Right, and a lot of people gave very uh, telling <laughs> and personal answers. And somebody, I don't know if it was T.S. Eliot or somebody else, but someone says, well, the saddest word in the English language is saddest. Obviously. (laughs) That's what it made me think of. It's a reboot has to win the reboot category. That's just, that's just how it is. I am not logged into Disney Plus, so I cannot check whether or not it gives an age warning for Kill la Kill. Unfortunately. Um, what it says I think it's like Deadpool or The Simpsons where you need like a 16 plus or 18 plus account gotcha okay so it's built into the account I assume you can tweak stuff with parental controls as well um, what it says they also added the Rampa adaptation which is about teenagers killing each other yeah yeah uh, yes right death game stuff um, very common <laughs> in Japanese shows as well as uh korean shows i think live action as well as anime stuff um yeah anyway sorry well that was fun uh well okay it's almost seven o'clock uh (laughs) let's see what we have to say here so here's what i'm thinking animation industry health check very general very spur of the moment let's just throw stuff out there I don't have a big master list of all the animation news from this year. That would be very helpful, but I don't think that really exists yet. Maybe in a couple weeks we'll we'll get articles like that. Um, Obviously, we have just, like, releases in general, right? Like, the... the, the, uh, We are aware of Mario Movie being the most profitable animated movie of the year, right? There's one indicator... Uh, obviously across the Spider-Verse, also very successful in in more metrics (laughs) than just uh, finances and and audience response. Um, But yeah, let's just think about it. Let's just throw some stuff out there. What were some of the things that that impacted animation this year, and do we see them as positives or negatives? Uh, So let's see. One thing I can say right off the bat, this little bear, which... Sorry, I make this smaller. That's anime. Um, <laughs> the visual symbolism here is incredibly rich. Uh, anime continues to... I mean, obviously, it, 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 it has found renewed and continuously growing interest, it would seem, from Western audiences and specifically audiences here in the U.S., However, I would say that it still very much remains its own thing. You know, it, it, it continues to be pigeonholed in many ways, and uh, certainly just in terms of uh, kind of overall public perception outside of just animation fans, anime is still that weird thing, you know, with <laughs> the kind of fan service you would see in Kill la Kill, or, you know... The, the, the cutesy character designs of Genshin Impact and the other uh, Hoyo games. I, I, I don't think it has been fully integrated, and certainly in terms of production, it hasn't been integrated at all, right? And, like, there's a question of whether it ever could or should be integrated into Western animation. There have been certain studios that tried to do anime-looking shows here in the West, um what was it blood of blood of zeus lord of zeus there is that netflix show that as far as i know is western but trying to be anime Uh, then you also have anime adaptations of western stuff western source material like the scott pilgrim anime of course it was you know animated by a japanese studio but uh the source material is is canadian as far as i know (laughs) right uh flipnote says have you heard of the amazing digital circus i think that's cool oh yeah We've talked about it here. I tried to do a reaction stream that didn't really go well. Then I made a video about it where I was like, yeah, there are things I don't like about it. There are things I do like about it. But overall, I I see it as a net positive. And that's a good thing to bring up here, too. I don't know uh, 
what imagery within this sort of um, evokes Amazing Digital Circus as well as other independently animated projects, but we have to include it here, right? Um, how about... Uh, hmm. <laughs> how about the heart? I like that. You know? I like the idea that, that indie animation, and it, it, certainly through Amazing, Amazing Digital Circus and a number of other independent projects that were Kickstarter projects, things like that, um, they, ha they do now represent a major aspect of the industry. Uh, I can't say whether or not they're a significant aspect in terms of finances and revenue, but certainly in terms of attention, which is sort of, you know, the most important thing <laughs> in an online uh, community that's just, it is all about attention. It is the attention economy. That's what matters most. Um, a lot of indie stuff is getting huge amounts of attention, or should I say a handful of very prominent indie projects are getting a massive amount of attention. An amazing digital circus for 2023 is absolutely at the front of the line. Um, sorry that it's a broken heart. That's just what we have. But yes, amazing, amazing. Well, we can fix that. Hang on. Amazing digital circus absolutely uh, deserves to be included here, and to get very corny, indie animation represents the true heart <laughs> of contemporary animation, as opposed to studio work. Uh, Wetness says, what about other foreign animation outside of anime and European? Uh, also, American anime like the Boondocks, Avatar, Samuel Jackson, maybe Invincible. Oh, yeah, there's been plenty, for sure. Yeah, I would absolutely include Last Airbender stuff. Yeah. Um, Samurai Jack is interesting. I I could see how conceptually it borrows a lot, and obviously in terms of cultural imagery, yes. But style feels Western to me, uh, just because I associate Gendy with so many other, you know, very American shows <laughs> and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good question too. Other, other foreign animation that's, yeah, not anime, not European. I mean, it's, it's just rare. It's more rare for it to stick out. Although amazing digital circus, as far as I know, is Australian, right? I don't know if that's what you had in mind. Um, but that's something, <laughs> that's something that's not coming from Japan. That's not coming from the UK and that's not coming from the US. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, if it's, we would have to go back to that list of, um, features that are eligible for the Oscar nominations. Uh, obviously there was plenty of stuff on there I hadn't come across yet. And unfortunately too, um, even when it just comes to Europe, let alone many other regions of the world, uh, distribution is tough for new releases to actually get your hands on some more more obscure stuff or, or stuff that, you know, doesn't already have a major distributor in the U.S., it can be really tough. It might be years before there's a nice, you know, proper legal way uh, to watch that movie outside of, like, a special screening. So I feel that that really, it really harms um, the impact, obviously, uh, and delays discourse in plenty of cases. Uh, and, yeah, if, if, if you're lucky, one of those movies will get nominated for an Oscar, in which case, the, whoever's in charge of the marketing will send out screener discs, the members of the Academy, and sometimes, at least here in L.A., you can get your hands on one of those. So you see what I'm saying? It, it's Even if you hear about a really great movie um, not produced in the West, not produced in these major animation markets, uh, it can be difficult even to, to watch the darn thing, even if you're really excited about it. So... Um, so that so unfortunately, <laughs> any other uh, you know, any other for, foreign or international animation outside of the major markets would be like here, you know, like it, it's it 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 almost doesn't even show up on the map unless there's a really good instance, you know, um, that I'm forgetting about right now. But but currently I'm thinking of amazing amazing digital circus. Obviously did have a major impact, and here it shows up in in, in the indie animation. Um, which, by the way, 
I know this doesn't make sense for a health checkup, but we're just going to use grades. Indie Animation gets an A. It's an A plus even. It's doing very well. Anime? Sorry. You get a B. Uh, just because <laughs> I don't think that the um, rapidly advancing popularity of anime in the West, I don't think it's tied one-to-one -to, -one to the progression of that particular style. You know? We are getting some very new and interesting ideas from anime constantly. There is stuff that rises to the top. Um, but at least at the moment, I can't think of a particular show, uh, anime show or movie that released in the last year that completely changed my mind about like how things are done and that blew me away with incredible original ideas. At least at the moment, I'm not thinking of that. And unfortunately, not even uh, The Boy and the Heron really... Uh, reach that point for me um they get a b uh what other aspects i don't know where do, where does the mario movie go where does just like plain financial profitability go for this whole discussion uh this would be tough what it says outside of the u.s and japan what other country would you pick for a godzilla movie you mean you mean in terms of like setting or for someone else to make a Godzilla movie? Uh, in terms of setting, I would love to see Godzilla in, like, the desert. You know? I don't know if there are any canonical Godzilla monsters that, that live in the desert. I don't know if Mothra lives out there. Uh, probably not. I think that would be neat. I think there are things you could do in terms of natural disasters for one thing in the desert but also just the locale is so different from what we tend to see um and for obvious reasons we associate godzilla with the ocean i think that's where godzilla lives <laughs> as far as i know um but that would be something different unless someone can point me to you know one of the 82 godzilla movies that have been made already that that did happen to take place um in the desert but at least to my knowledge, I haven't seen anything like that. Um, let's see. Okay, so yeah. Uh, we, by <laughs> by nature of, uh, of the Mario movie alone, we have to face the facts in a good way that animation continues to make a lot of money, right? Uh, even the box office rally of Elemental, like it proves that as well. It, it, it wasn't breaking records on its own. But meanwhile, Mario was just just raking it in absolutely and while i don't like that movie well i don't think <laughs> well i don't think it's a a good movie you know or that it, sh it it was popular you can't argue with that aspect and that's kind of good news it's kind of good news in the sense that animated movies can make money period um we won't question for now the kind of animated movie that tends to make the most money. So, uh, what do we think? How about the spare ribs here? Important, but not vital. You know, you could survive without them. This is the money category. And in that, well, is it healthy, though? Is the financial success of the Mario Brothers movie healthy for animation? Hmm. Yeah, the cynicism is coming back. The cynicism is coming back. I'm th I'm thinking C. <laughs> what a C! Wow. Also, what a terrible graphic this has turned into, but I'm all right with it. Uh, positive that they can still make a lot of money, these animated movies. But if this is what people associate with profitable animation globally, not just in the U.S., not healthy. Because, as we know, the major studios tend to just want to mimic things that have already been successful because that's the least risky bet they can make. At least in their eyes, it's it's the least risky bet. Um, yeah, 
I don't think it's healthy. It, it's sort of a, a, a positive sign <laughs> in terms of interest in, in animation, but I don't think it, it translates to a healthy medium, a healthy industry. Yeah, especially given the fact that based on the little bits of information we get about how illumination works, it's maybe not the best place to work. It's maybe not, um, you know, maybe they don't treat their team as well as they could. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not making any definitive statements there. I'm just saying. But it says both. Um, oh, for like where one of those movies could be set and who someone else to make it. So yeah, let's put Godzilla in the desert. Uh, it could be Northern Africa, I suppose. Um, well, then I was tempted to say like the American Southwest, but then we're back in the U.S., so we have to avoid that. Um, or snow, just like a, you know, crazy Arctic tundra. That could be pretty fun for a Godzilla movie too, right? Especially if Godzilla isn't really um, well adapted to frigid environments. <laughs> Ooh, and I'm sure there already is a monster like this, but I, I love the idea of having um, some enormous underwater sea monster situation. You know, it's been frozen in the ice or something, and it suddenly awakens, and it's much larger than Godzilla, and <laughs> Godzilla is out of his element? I don't know if Godzilla has a gender. Um, you know, Godzilla needs dry land. You know? That's the best I got. A Greenland Godzilla. <laughs> That's a nice middle ground, because then we could still have people, you know, if it was the Arctic Circle or, like, Antarctica. You don't have many excuses to bring people around, right? Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, this graphic is really... I don't know. Uh... <laughs> I'm happy about the inclusion of the indie animation stuff. That was a really good point to, to bring up, uh, Flip Notes. Um, Mario Movie is here. We, we had to just talk about the Mario Movie at, at some point. Um, how about this? This is going to get a little more abstract. But I'm worried. I'm associating the eyes with identity here. And fame. It's the best I got. Um, this has to do with brand. So, this is something we've talked about before. Um, I'll go ahead and put a D here. Uh, just the, the concept <laughs> of branding and brand recognition in terms of what projects get greenlit in the animation industry and what ends up actually making money and the, and the perceptions of why something is successful or unsuccessful. So we talked before about, I, I believe it was one of the studio heads at DreamWorks. It might've been at a competing studio. I'm not quite sure, but they basically said it was insane to put Ruby Gilman's name in the title of her own movie because that is not a name that people are already incredibly familiar with. So like, because there was no brand recognition, they saw, they, they thought it was insane to put an original character's name right in the title and, and even to release this movie so prominently when it wasn't based on an established IP. Um, I do not think Ruby Gilman failed because it's, original stuff I, I don't think the problem is that it's an original story original characters the exact same thing with 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 elemental right that is an entirely original story brand new cast of characters not based on an established ip they had very different results financially and critically i think um and then you know we have a uh, mario brothers movie doing incredibly well also, Leo doing incredibly well, which, yeah, it's not based on established IP, but it's Adam Sandler. And that, that movie success, I have to imagine, is driven in large part um, by that brand recognition. You know, by, oh, celebrity voice acting. <laughs> Another thing that has sort of been plaguing uh, big-budget animation for a long time now. I, I think just this 
overwhelming concept of the importance of branding and brand recognition is a harmful aspect of contemporary animation, at least within like Hollywood. I, I think it's a negative. So I've given it a poorly drawn B, and that's the eyes. In fact, hang on. Hang on. I got this. It's a cool guy. Doesn't that just scream brand? This is a cool guy who thinks he's just too cool for school. He's going to make money at the box office just because everybody knows who he is. And I, yeah, I, I see that as a negative. <laughs> I see that as a negative thing. Sorry, let me get caught up. When it says Godzilla is a male... Uh, and it, I, I want to say the 70s, he had Godzilla Jr., the mother is unknown. <laughs> well, just like um, uh, Bowser Jr., right? Like, where, where, where how, where, where you come from? Flipnote says, is Mickey Mouse in the free domain yet, uh, or uh, public domain? Just asking, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, well, there are also things I don't understand about public domain because there are indeed certain uh, properties that are just seen uh, as being so profitable and, and they you know have an active uh, business around them that they will continually have protections, right? Uh, and they will continually prevent something from entering into public domain. But let's see what the internet says here. Um, the beloved mouse, nearly, central, nearly a century old, will soon enter public domain. The original Mickey Mouse's copyright expires in 2024. Uh, uh, let's see. Mm. Okay, so the copyright to Steamboat Willie and some of the other first, uh, the early shorts, will expire. So those particular works will uh, enter into the public domain, but everything that has been made with him later on is still copyrighted until those individual copyrights expire. So it's, it's not for the character as a whole, um, which makes sense. I, I feel like it's in a different category. I feel like that goes into intellectual property. I don't know. I Again, I, I'm not the person to, to get into this stuff. Um, but yeah, it sounds like just certain early, you know, the earliest Mickey, Ma Mickey Mouse stuff, Mickey Mouse products will be public domain. So you ver you may very well see them pop up on like YouTube, you know, and they can't be claimed, right? You know, you're, you're not allowed to claim those. They're, they belong to everybody. Uh, what it says, edit, it was, uh, Junior was around 93 to 95, uh, and Godzilla is his adoptive dad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what does the lore Bible look like? for godzilla <laughs> oh my goodness um <laughs> witness says still cool godzilla is the best fictional single dad i will i'll give that to you i offhand i cannot think of three other uh fictional single dads right now i just can't um oh wait no 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 uh the professor in Powerpuff Girls, right? As far as I know. He's okay. I, I don't know how he stacks up against Godzilla. And I don't know whether it's it's good parenting to let the kids like fight crime and save the world or if that's a, a sort of lapse in um, judgment or the establishment of boundaries. You know what I mean? Look how prominent this anime circle is now. Oh, that's not. Oh, no. I put it all on the same layer. Well, that's okay. The anime circle will continue to be very large. Uh, okay. What else? Um... <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I'm. I've, it's. It's. I should have compiled a list of just the biggest news of the year, 
Amazing Digital Circus is up there, absolutely. Uh, Ruby Gilman's failure, I guess, is notable <laughs> in a few different ways. Uh, Elemental rebounding at, at the box office is, is pretty fantastic. Um, how about this? I know this is a little bit more specific than what we've been saying so far, but this, the, the foot, the toes poking through, I guess it's a sock and not a cast. Yeah. Uh, this is, in my eyes, the state of Disney right now. Um, sorry, those, the pen, I have to get this pen size, brush size just right. In my eyes, this is where Disney is at. And uh, I have absolutely seen other people really, um, really pointing this out recently. And not just in terms of Disney's uh, animation output from this year, which was relatively minimal, but just, you know, things that they wanted to be big box office hits that were not at all. I, I don't think their Marvel stuff for this year was really very popular. Um, obviously, Wish, I mean, we just talked about it earlier today, nowhere near what they expected. That's as far as I can see, they really, really <laughs> expected that one to go places, um, if only in the sense of, like, you know, not even box office stuff, but just songs, merchandising, etc. It it felt to me like that was a big part of the plan for Wish, um, and then as well as the uh, the uh, anniversary angle, because without without Wish doing well, what what do you think about for Disney's 100th anniversary? They had that insane auction that we looked at. I don't know, a couple months ago or something. Um, they had like scattered, very specialized uh, events. They had things for like the D23 people, I think. So, no, D23 is the event. The special club. <laughs> the special Disney people club. Uh, they had special events, I, I think, here and there. But what else? You know, like it would have made the most sense to hammer home that anniversary with a movie. And they just absolutely didn't stick the landing. Um, and until I actually watch the movie, I can't really speak as to why. <laughs> I don't have a, a, a good explanation for that. Um, other than it just looks like it was not a very good movie. Could we call it hubris? <laughs> Can we say that they just put too many chips on that one? I don't know. Flipnote says, Do you know with the cartoonish hairstyle... Uh, do you know what the cartoonish hairstyle where it's a toothpaste toothpaste shaped with a tip is called? Mm, I'm thinking Johnny Bravo based on what you're describing, but I don't know if 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 I'm getting to it. So feel free to add more um info, but yeah, offhand I I I I'm thinking of Johnny Bravo or sort of like, you know, Greaser style hairdos, very curly, tapered, things like that. But if there's a, a specific name for it, I've, I have no idea. Uh, Wetna says if I have to rank single dads in fiction, one is Godzilla, two is Byakuya, Byakuya, sorry, Dr. Stone. Both are adopted or adoptive dads. Three, Bowser, or Sojiro and Persona 5. I, I do know. Uh, another adoptive dad, and five, the professor, professor. Oh, I'm glad he made it on there. And yeah, I, I'm, there's probably a bunch in anime that I just don't even know about. Um, <laughs> but I'm impressed. I'm impressed you got to five. That's pretty good. Flipnote says, uh, my, "My PF PFP is a fan art of someone. Uh, profile picture is a fan art of someone's old online character." Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's so tiny here. I'm trying to. Oh, if I move it here, it'll move on the stream. I'll check later. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm, 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 mm. Okay, well, my gosh, I don't think I've good. I've done a good job with this. Not too surprising. Um, but yeah, if there was any other major news, major animation news this year, I mean, I guess there were the layoffs. I believe DreamWorks, right? DreamWorks had some pretty hefty layoffs. 
yeah, relative to their their full staff, uh, about seventy people. It's about four percent of staff. Okay, so not not as um not quite as major as some of the uh, cuts in in video game staffing this year, but still absolutely significant. And as far as I know, it was the first time in quite a while uh, that one of the major studios had had taken that turn. Um, and then I feel you guys will have to remind me. But was there also news about Disney splitting some of their animation efforts? It might have been DreamWorks as well, where they were just moving locations because they couldn't afford the particular real estate they were using for one of their operations, I think. Um, yeah, and that was post Ruby Gilman, so we all, or at least I felt, oh, okay, this is an obvious repercussion of one of their big bets not doing especially well. But that's absolutely something to, to look out for, and I don't know. How about this, um, uh, whatever this is supposed to be. The threat of recession, which as far as I know, I don't know if we are in one yet. I continue to hear it's still in the future. But the threat of recession is absolutely a factor in the overall health of the industry, specifically for major, um, you know, Hollywood studios. Uh, so that's F. The only, you know, the only potential, I don't even know if we could call it a bright side, but a, a potential positive aspect in response to a, a recession is that, it, it, as far as I know, entertainment is one of the very few industries that tends to survive financial wide-scale financial hardship relatively well and the reasoning is is relatively clear right just that people still want entertainment perhaps even more so when other aspects of their lives are not going very well the only switch now and it's a big one that we have to consider uh, with that kind of interaction is <sighs> disney plus is not is still not profitable right Many of the streaming services are deficit spending and, and have been for years. So despite however many millions of, of dollars in uh, subscription revenue they're, they're pulling in per month or per quarter, whatever, uh, it's not enough. It is still not enough. It, it is still not reached equilibrium. And just in general, the ways in which um, we actually pay for <laughs> entertainment that we want to consume has changed drastically. So while in the past, entertainment might have been relatively safe from financial recessions and things of that nature, um, that is not at all guaranteed now. And this is something that was highlighted very much by the, uh, by the strikes, right? Um, monetization in entertainment has changed enormously. And it hasn't readjusted quite yet to the point where everybody is, is happy to continue participating in it either, either as a um, as a creative and, and helping to produce something or as an audience member and consuming various pieces of media for any given price so <laughs> whatever this little doorway is on this man's gut um, <laughs> is a potential horrible recession coming up which would you know really have an incredibly negative impact on uh, at least mainstream animation studios right now. Would that result in more of the independent animation studios coming to the forefront? Possibly. I continue to be told that uh, recessions and, and economic downturns are when more uh, a lot of smaller companies can kind of get their start and, and rise to prominence. Don't know whether that's true, but if it is, okay, the door has been opened. You know, amazing digital circus and, and uh, not what a burger. Uh, the Worthy Kids series, Big Top Burger, uh, and any number of other independent animation projects, they've, they've shown us how it's done. They have shown us that it is plausible uh, for an independent project to get incredible attention and adequate funding as a result of that attention. So, half and half. But at least for the studios, yeah. Not, not helpful. It, it is not a, a sunny prognosis. For that particular situation. Wow. Um, 
Okay. Well, uh, like so many other streams, this has been a, a somewhat interesting experiment uh, in in sort of our main topic for the week. Um, and there's probably a, a lot, lot more to talk about here in terms of the overall health of animation right now. And in fact, yeah, one one final point that I do want to bring up before we start to, to finish things here for today is I feel like we need to come back to the concept of uh, diversity and representation in especially mainstream animation and filmmaking. And, and please don't roll your eyes because here's, here's the issue as I see it right now at least is that this was a big hot button topic just a few years ago. It got tons of media attention and in any sort of relatively novel inclusion or diversity either on or off screen got headlines. And there was at least a, a, a certain amount of audience energy and enthusiasm in response to that stuff. I feel like that conversation is very, very much faded away. I don't know whether people just feel like it's um, not an issue anymore. Like somehow we've achieved an ideal in terms of representing many different kinds of people and many different kinds of, of stories on the screen. I don't feel like that's where we are at all I, if anything i just feel like the the trending nature of the topic has faded away um which is unfortunate because i don't i don't see it i don't know it, and it would it would also be a difficult thing for me to judge i guess in theory we could just go down the list of oh here are the directors and writers and the casts of various big successful animated movies of 2023 I, I I don't know. <laughs> I hope, I hope <laughs> that uh, especially on-screen representation stuff um, continues to integrate more and more. And maybe that's a positive side of the discussion fading away a little bit in terms of prominence is that we got so much very, uh, so much artificial representation, especially from Disney. Right, like they did such a bad job over multiple projects of attempting to include those aspects and then attempting to promote those aspects of the movies. Basically never successful, in my opinion, the, w the way they handled that stuff. And that's one thing. So that was like the, the try-hard results of, uh, you know, attempting to include more diversity and inclusion. Um that's not the end goal, though. We don't want try hard. We don't want token representation, right? We want we want representation and inclusion that feels completely natural. We want we want stuff that feels very authentic. Um, as far as I've heard, for example, Elemental is is a very good example of that. Of just like, okay, here is a story that I would like to share. It's based on my background. This is a background, you know, that that maybe the majority of, of people in the U.S. in particular are not familiar with. This is not part of their own life experience. Genuinely sharing something different, a different perspective, um, and sharing it in an interesting way. Regardless of how great or, or not great a movie Elemental is, just in terms of that aspect of the filmmaking, it's successful. Like that, that is the ideal, at least in my eyes, it, it, for it to feel as natural um, and not uh, not invisible obviously but just like it can tell the story without being promoted as the most important story ever kind of like some of the that that uh sponsored content for nimona where like they're still leaning in that direction they're still leading with hey the movie part is whatever but look at this one part this one aspect of it that is apparently so progressive and groundbreaking in 2023 we're in it when it really doesn't feel that way Wow, what a ramble. Uh, <laughs> uh, I need a visual representation of this. I need to include this. Um, how about the apple? The apple. Reps. <laughs> we all know what it means. Uh... I'm going to say C+. Plus. I'm going to say some bright spots, but we're not there. <laughs> we're not there. Um, 
potentially a good thing that it has stepped it, it's not in the spotlight anymore i think that gives uh creatives an opportunity to include these you know include their own stories in a way that feels yeah natural and, and integrated i i think that would be great um yes Wetna says sorry if i sound up uh, no don't don't no you're good <laughs> is indie a genre or style uh Wow, yeah, so it's it's funny, the timing. It's something we talked about last week as well. Uh, this set off some controversy for the Game Awards stuff just because the reboots, uh, or not reboots, oh my gosh, wow. I want that reboot category bad. The nominations for the category of best independent game um, raised that exact question, right? So there were some people who had the impression that indie means a certain style right a certain look a, a certain feel you know it has certain aesthetic trappings and then other people feel that that indie means um sort of its literal definition which means that it's produced independently outside of major studios and typically on a much smaller budget and with a much smaller team so that same discussion has appeared in music for indie music uh, indie video games as i just said and it's kind of the same thing here with indie animation, although I think at least so far, the examples I was talking about earlier of Amazing Digital Circus and um, uh, Big Top Burger, those are uh, animated series that are not made with the support of a giant studio like um, Disney, or they, they don't have the f you know, funding from a streaming service like, like Netflix or something like that. Um, it's, it's a team working on their own. And at least in most cases, they have fewer resources than what we, we consider mainstream animation, which is sort of the, the opposite of, of indie. So the, the short answer is that it, there's disagreement and some people do feel, oh, it's more of a style as opposed to a, um, the conditions in which the thing was produced. But I feel like at least for now, as compared to music and video games, a lot of people seem to agree that independent animation just means people working on their own, you know, people who don't have a huge budget um, and who maybe don't have a huge amount of uh, training or, or resources and stuff like that. Um, anyway, so that's a that's sort of a brief summary of, of the discussions around that topic for a few years now. Um, but yeah, at least for me, that's certainly what, what indie animation means more so than style, is, oh, it's a team working outside of the studio system, doing their own thing, and getting their own funding however they can, whether that's through Kickstarter or by working other jobs or selling merch or, or anything like that. Um, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, again, I think, the, I think what we saw of indie animation this year was incredibly positive, and I think that it benefits all of animation. Um, it potentially even inspires... The bigger studios to do more creative work hopefully it does not inspire them to just steal ideas from smaller teams that's sort of a worst case scenario um anyway but yeah i i think i have to stop just for my own sanity um and for the sake of my throat uh but yeah i don't know i i hope this was at least moderately interesting uh, to some of you folks watching um and overall, I mean, wow, is it even possible to, to summarize? Oops. Oh, did I lose the... Oh, I turned off the stylus. That's what it was. Total. Is animation healthy right now? Was 2023 a healthy year for animation as an art form? Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> Positives and negatives. Uh, but no sweeping generalizations. I, 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 I don't feel it's dying off. You know, I, I don't feel that 2D animation is having some kind of incredible resurgence, as always. You know, it's been somewhat common, but not the norm. Um indie animation on its own has existed for quite a while now 
and previous projects have been relatively successful, but Amazing Digital Circus represents a massive spike in the success and general audience interest in, in, in independent animation, regardless of whether or not they know it's indie stuff. Um, very profitable animated movies, or one in particular, but it wasn't good. <laughs> but it wasn't a good animated movie. <laughs> and yeah, there continues to be that looming threat of financial crisis, uh, supposedly just on the horizon, um, that would certainly shake things up in terms of the dynamics between professional animation and, and or studio animation and indie animation. So, I don't know. Also, Goose says hello. Hello, Goose. What's up? How have you been? Did you already take care of the migration, or? Yes, I got. Yeah. Um. Yes. And yeah, once again, uh, in terms of supporting and and sharing different kinds of stories from different kinds of of artists, uh, points of perspective. Yes, technically. It, it did happen, <laughs> but again, not, not exactly on a wide scale, um, at least in terms of studio stuff or, or, or the, the projects that caught the most attention. Who says good? What about you? I'm doing all right. Yeah, I'm doing all right. Um, yeah, I'm actually, <laughs> timing is funny, but yeah, I am, I am getting ready to wind down, I think, just because I'm really starting to lose my voice. We've been streaming for a good, a good while by now, <laughs> um, but yeah. We've just been reflecting on the year in animation. Uh, and then who knows? Next week, maybe we'll switch to video game stuff. I don't know. I don't know if people like when we flip back, you know, flip-flop back and forth so much. Um, but there's certainly a lot to talk about there that is not related to the Game Awards business. Um, so, yeah. And can I tell you, by the way, I was looking around... I could have sworn I was thinking of what kind of dumb graphic I could have for the stream. And I was like, well, surely there's some ripoff version of Operation as like a Flash or a Flash game equivalent on the internet. And I'll show that and I'll mess around with that. That could be kind of fun. Uh, no, there isn't. They, the, the copyright on the official Operation game is locked down. Maybe we'll even get a claim just for showing this image. Um, there are, however, hundreds or probably thousands of incredibly disturbing, violent, cartoony operation surgery-style games where you pull grotesque things out of cartoon bodies. I'm sorry for sharing that with you, but I was very surprised. <laughs> operation is such a cutesy game. Why? Why? Who's... Who's making those? What is that about? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, but yeah. So there's that. Uh, and yes, if anybody wants to go back and watch the early bits of the stream, we, we talked about plenty of the animation news for the past week or so. Um, and if anyone's curious about what's going on here on, on the channel, uh, I do plan to have a... I guess I'll call it a review. I plan to have a, a review of the new Ghibli movie, uh, The Boy and the Heron, up um, hopefully sometime this week, if I can find the time. Um, I did shoot some footage and everything, so I just have to really uh, sit down and, and edit a bunch of stuff. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to say about that movie, and I have a feeling um, it's a movie that will continue to be talked about on YouTube for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> for many months or even years to come which is relatively rare in terms of modern media so yeah a lot to say i don't i don't want to to give away too much of you know in terms of my thoughts on that movie um the only other thing i will say about the boy and the heron just my my viewing experience you know is um when it ended and I won't, I won't say anything about just the way it ended in terms of editing and shot choice was so abrupt that the audience, like, was visibly shocked. <laughs> like, they, 
visibly pulled away because of the end of that movie. Very strange. Very strange. But it's something I'll talk about in, in the video, too. Toots says, good night, good night, Toots. Thank you so much for being here. As always, I really, really appreciate it, even when, you know, regardless of whatever we're talking about. <laughs> it's always fun. Happy to have you here. Um, but yeah, I should probably stop now. Uh, I'll, I'll put that video up as, as soon as I can. Um, and otherwise, yeah, I, I guess I'll be back for the next stream on Wednesday. I don't think I'm doing any holiday stuff yet. Probably not. Yeah, so I should be back next week for a stream Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific. Um, we'll see. We'll see in terms of a, a topic. We'll brainstorm a little bit. Uh, but yeah, for now, thank you so much to everybody uh, live, everybody here in the chat, especially incredibly helpful for keeping the streams going. Uh, thank you to the folks watching the, the archive version of the stream later on. Also very helpful. And yeah. I think I need to stop talking now. Uh, and thanks, Goose. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Goose. I'm sorry that we were wrapping up just as just as you came along. Uh, but come on back next week. We'll we'll chat about some stuff and uh, fly safe. Um, cool. All right. I'll wrap it up there. Uh, thanks so much, guys. That's all for now. Thanks for stopping by.